following is a podcast brought to you by the Alex Kirsch Project. Elon Musk has officially bought Twitter. Does this mean that once again speech is going to be free? John Fetterman and Dr. Oz had their debate for the U.S. Senate this week. How was the debate? Who won the debate? Secretary Pete Buttigieg was on Stephen Colbert's show to talk about infrastructure and inflation. What was all else was said and what are my assessments upon it? Armed vigilantes are being seen at ballot drop boxes. What is this all about exactly? Finally, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, was attacked by a man that was looking for her. What's his prognosis and what is the motive of the attacker? All of this on this week's episode of Current Events on Tap. It's time for another episode of Current Events on Tap with your host, Alex Kirsch, a podcast from the Alex Kirsch Project. Hey, that's me, Army retiree, truck driver, pragmatic progressive, political commentator, and you know what? I'm not going to lie. I'm also a clout chaser. If this is your first time listening, please do me a solid hit that like and share and subscribe to my Spreaker, YouTube, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. This podcast gives you this week's current events, and I also do like what I like to call the Beer of the Week. I pick one beer and I review it based on price, pour, aroma, taste, and I give it an overall rating. Be sure to catch me every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Spreaker. And then catch me at your earliest convenience on the other platforms, YouTube, Spotify, and once again, iHeartRadio. Just type in the Alex Kirsch Project and there you'll find this podcast. Or you can also type in current events on tap. Now, without further ado, it is time for the Beer of the Week. of the week this week is Wango, also known as Paradise in a Bottle, or actually, if you want to be technical, it's a can in this case. It is from Atwater Brewery, based out of Detroit, Michigan. Now, I've already reviewed beers from Atwater Brewery, but once again, just do a quick summation. The history of Atwater Brewery, Brewery was founded in Detroit, Michigan in 1997. The original owners wanted to bring back the Bohemian style, which, for those that are not aware, is where it portrays a light-colored, clear beer with forward hop aromas and flavors that are floral or spicy or herbal or herbal if you're British, or earthy with a slight malt sweetness and, you know, somewhat unaccompanied bitterness. Mark Reith, who is a graduate of Michigan State University, bought Atwater Brewery in 2005 and... The first beers that this, they pushed out was the Dirty Blonde, which is a beer that I've already reviewed already, the Vanilla Java Porter, oh, excuse me, along with the Hop Appeal and Decadent Dark cho- ch- uh, Chocolate. Now, these are beers that I have not all completely done so far. The Dirty Blonde is the only one that I have reviewed, but all the other beers I definitely plan on reviewing in the near future. But, however, we're going to talk about the Wango beer, okay? It's kind of an interesting sounding name to it. That's because it's a mixture of both wheat and mango, essentially, okay? It has an alcohol percentage of 4.9%. The style of beer is a fruit-style beer. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give it the rating of one mugs to five mugs. One mug being the lowest, five mugs being the highest. So, price. I'm going to give this a four out of five. I bought this at Kern's Sausages in Frank uh, Frankenmuth, Michigan. And it, I bought it for a reasonable price of $12.00. For a six pack of cans. This might seem kind of steep for some people, but let's just remember one thing. This is not like a typical mass produced brewery. This is one that is specific to Michigan, and plus, let alone the fact that this is a seasonal beer. This is a seasonal beer that's between available between March and August, so I was actually fortunate to be able to buy this because it was still available here in Frankenmuth, essentially. So I was able to buy this, and I'm glad I did. Now, $12, once again, might seem a little steep, but you know what? This is actually a pretty good price for a fairly decent beer, honestly. Uh, the pour. I'm going to give this a 3 out of 5. It's a very easy pour, not much of a foamy head that comes along with it. If you just pour it regularly from a can, you don't really have much risk from it. I didn't try pouring it, actually, from the uh, physics 
but I might try it one of these days. But it has a very nice color, but once again, the pour, it's really nothing to scream about, honestly. The aroma, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 5, actually. It's got a very pleasant, fruity smell to it. It's not nearly as pleasant smelling as some of the other fruity beers that I've had, but it smells really good, actually. You can smell the, sm the sweetness and the maltiness, actually, in the beer. You know, you just kind of just take a whiff, a whiff of it, and just it actually smells quite pleasant. Again, it's not nearly as good as some of the other beers, but actually, it's not bad, though. The taste, well, let's take a drink, why don't we? Again, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. It doesn't taste nearly as good as it smells, it's still very refreshing. The mango and the wheat taste, it's kind of a peculiar, not a typical kind of taste that you would actually try to combine to put together, really. It's not really something I can really put my finger on it. But again, it's not bad. It's not a terrible taste by a long shot. You kind of get the sweetness and you kind of get the slight tart and the maltiness from it. There isn't a strong bite to it like some... Uh, beers with a lot of hops in it have but all the same it's still quite refreshing it still tastes quite good so again i'm gonna give it a four to five um overall i'm gonna give it once again a four a very strong four out of five it's a good beer it's very good especially uh for a seasonal beer i would picture this as a beer that you would just buy and have in a cooler and you're about to have like a, a cookout with your friends or something like that this is something i would definitely recommend to have especially on a hot summer day with it getting a lot colder here in michigan you know but still i'm gonna drink this regardless what time of the year it is i mean it's beer for crying out loud but i can picture you know just sitting out there on a hot summer day or something like that and you're just like you know what i need a nice cold refreshing beer this seems like one that I would actually kind of go with. So, honestly, I would definitely say this is a great kind of beer. I highly recommend you if you like the fruity tasting kinds of beers. This is really good. It's got a, a nice, very pleasant taste to it, but a much more pleasant smell than it actually does taste. So, be sure to find this at your earliest convenience between March and August. And give it a shot, why don't you? What do you have to lose? Anyway. All right. Now, it's on to current events. <laughs> Billionaire Elon Musk has finally decided it was time to fight wokeness by buying Twitter. He stated, the bird is freed. Not that it was there any danger of that anyway. There's been a massive ongoing dispute, primarily from the conservative talking heads, about how social media is very unfair and they feel like their voices are being silenced on social media. Well, first things first, I always want to get something straight. Social media is not the end-all be-all of free speech Let's put it that way. You sign up for social media. You probably didn't read the rules and the regulations. Anytime you see an update to the rules on social media, I don't see many people actually reading these rules. But all the same, by continuing to use social media, you're already agreeing to the terms and conditions. Now, I've been banned on social media for the dumbest reasons. One time I was banned on Facebook for two weeks for telling some chucklehead I had a disagreement with to leave deflection to the United States field artillery. It doesn't suit you. I was suspended for two weeks for that statement, which I thought was completely absurd. I've literally had people like send me derogatory comments. I've had people like say, I'm going to find you. I'm going to come beat you up. And I've reported these comments and they said, eh, it's not that big of a deal. You know, they, I got the typical response. I've seen people say much worse things talking about like you know thank god for dead soldiers that they didn't get banned upon but for some reason i get banned for this which i thought was completely absurd all right i've also been suspended from twitter multiple times for ridiculous reasons and you know even now currently my facebook says i cannot go live why i haven't the slightest idea but I'm not freaking out about it. I might disagree with it. I might be a little confused about that. But I'm not going to be losing my mind about the fact that, oh, my God, my Twitter is banned. What am I going to do? My Facebook is banned. What is going to happen? I don't really care. I mean, this just means that I can't comment on things, which is not the end of the world. I mean, there's been some times where I've taken breaks from social media, where I've taken breaks from Twitter and Facebook, you know. It's really not that big of a deal. I mean, social media is, in some cases, social media is kind of like one of the things that could be like the downfall of society because people just spend all their time on it, essentially. Do I spend a great deal of time on social media? Absolutely, I do. I use social media all the time. When I'm on the road, I'm usually on Discord and stuff like that. 
listening to other people talk. I'm usually like listening to YouTube and stuff. I mean, it, it's it's a part of our it's part of American life essentially. Social media has pretty much been ingrained in our societies, essentially. Okay, so once again, he has bought Twitter. And in the first day, he bought Twitter for $44 billion. I say that again, $44 billion. One of the first things he did is he fired the four top executives, and they might actually be entitled to a golden parachute of, (laughs) wait for it, $200 million. Now, that's a hell of a golden parachute, if you don't mind my saying. I mean, hell, if I got fired and I was given a golden parachute of like $200 million. I'd be happy with that. I could survive off of $200 million, but we don't know if he's really going to pay them. Uh, uh, he's, if he's even going to pay these people. Now there was this rumor going around that he was going to fire 75% of the employees that work there, but there's no guarantee that's going to happen. Apparently that, and apparently some people have gone on Twitter saying, Oh my God, Elon Musk has fired all the engineers. I looked it up. It didn't appear to have any real truth to it whatsoever. So, that remains to be seen if he's going to fire him, just bring in his own people. But it sounds like already that that he just basically wants army of yes, man. That's just my personal opinion. I could be wrong about that, but Elon Musk seems the kind of guy's like, this was like his own the libs moment. He's worried about wokeness is becoming too ingrained in our society. No, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, a lot of people have been banned off of Twitter for spreading misinformation. It's that simple. But I'm going to go into that in a second. So... People now are demanding that Elon Musk lift bans on people like Donald Trump, which I don't care if he does. I don't care who he brings in or who he allows to take off the platform. What what people feel feel to realize is, once again, when you sign up for social media, you're not entitled to just stay on there. If social media platform thinks your rhetoric is dangerous or spreading serious information, for example, you're spreading this bullshit conspiracy theories about COVID or how the the, the vaccine is going to give you autism or how lies about the election being stolen, they have every right to ban you from their platform. Social media is not without consequences. You just can't post whatever the hell you want. I mean, are there some inconsistencies with social media? Absolutely. Does it seem kind of biased at times against particular parties? Of course it does. Are there people who bitch and cry, and are they still going to go post and bitch on there? Apps of freaking Lulu. You could bet your bottom dollar. They're going to bitch. They're going to cry about how social media is so unfair to them. Well, guess what? You can just cry me a river. It's not that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world, all right? If you don't like the fact that your favorite country music star or your favorite musician like Kid Rock is not able to post whatever the hell he wants to on Facebook— who cares? Get off Facebook if you're so angry about it. Be a person of your conviction, okay? I'm going to stay on Facebook. I'm going to stay on social media. And if I get kicked off, guess what I can do? I can just create another account. It's that simple. I mean, I, I can. it's not going to sway me that Elon Musk bought Twitter. Now, there are some people that say, I'm not going to be on Twitter anymore. I'm leaving, which is fine. They have every right to do so. I... People are entitled to do or are allowed to do whatever the hell they want. They can go on Twitter and post whatever the hell they want. And if it doesn't meet the terms of service, that's entirely onto Twitter. I mean, people post, you know, nude pictures of themselves on Twitter, you know, just to get people to go on their uh, uh, content or whatever they might have. It just to kind of entice some people. But it's just that's what social media does, though. If you don't like it, don't post on it. If you don't like Twitter, don't go on Twitter. It's that simple. I mean, I'm, I'm very, very, you know, I'm very, very consistent about this. But the thing is, social media platforms are known for banning people for some of the dumbest reasons. Even platforms like Discord and Twitch, YouTube. I mean, people get banned all the time for some of the dumbest reasons. But now, for the record, don't be fooled by dipshit Trump's platform, True Social. It is known for panning people who say the election was fair, that it wasn't stolen, or if you're critical of Trump in any way whatsoever. There are certain algorithms apparently in there where you can't be critical of Trump. You have to say he's the greatest president of all time. I mean, <laughs> I've never gone on True Social. I'm not going to give that guy a dime whatso freaking ever. So I'm not even going to waste my time going on True Social because I already know that True Social is just Trump social. That's all it really is. Now, people need to have a great understanding when it comes down to the Constitution, especially the First Amendment, okay? The First Amendment guarantees you the right to freedom of speech and freedom from persecution from the government. It's that simple. 
It says absolutely nothing about freedom from private entities. Now, the same people who wanted football players and basketball players and athletes fired from playing sports franchises for kneeling during the anthem are the same exact people who think it's unfair that people who spread misinformation on social media get banned. They think it's crap that a person can lie about a vaccine giving you autism can be banned from social media because they are spreading dangerous misinformation, but yet they want somebody that knelt for the anthem for for the two minutes that the anthem plays, they want those people kicked off the football team when they are actually out there, you know, protesting for a legitimate cause, might I add. Now, does the private, like, if the, the NFL, which is a private entity, essentially, even though some of their tax dollars have, some of our tax dollars have been spent to build their stadiums, do they have the right to actually force players to not kneel? Yes, but very rarely did that happen. You don't see anybody, like, really freaking out about that. Why? Because no one's doing it anymore, honestly. But again, the same people that are freaking out about the NFL players that were kneeling during the anthem are now freaking out saying, oh my God, yes, now finally we can speak our minds again. No, you really can't speak your minds again because once again, social media has every right to ban your platform if they feel it's absolutely necessary to do so. Now, again, the First Amendment means the government cannot arrest you on a public property for speaking your mind. However, if you... If your uh, uh, speech causes a riot or encourages violence or results in violence, you can actually be held liable. There's so much that people do not understand about our Constitution, and I truly believe that the Constitution as a whole, just the Constitution in general, needs to be a required class in high school. Like, in order to graduate, you need to have a good understanding of what the Constitution means. From the First Amendment all the way to, I think it's the 25th, 26th Amendment, you need to have a good understanding of what it means because there are so many people out there that are unaware about what their rights are, where their rights begin, where their rights end, because the Constitution, like, people think that the amendment means it cannot be changed. Amendment literally means subject to change because amendments can be changed at any point. It's not set in stone it's written on paper. It could be changed at any point. It's a starting point for our country, and we've had the Constitution change many times over our nation's history. But I think people need to have a better understanding of what the Constitution means, what it means for our country, where your rights are. Because if you want to know a good channel to find out when it comes down to understanding your uh, where your uh, um, rights come from and like what you can or cannot do, I highly suggest you go to the YouTube channel Audit the Audit. Because what they do is they review police activity and interactions, and there are some people on there that are auditors. And what an auditor does is somebody that kind of goes out into a public sector, starts videotaping from public sidewalks, and then people come out and they'll call the police. And the police will either come out and say, hey, listen, they don't want you on here anymore. It's like, well, I'm not here. I'm on public property. And if you're on public property, you are entitled to video whatever the hell you want to actually now, could it be considered a possible threat? It's possible, depending on the situation. But the thing is, I keep saying this. Understanding where your rights are, what you can or cannot do, is so essential. Social media has absolutely nothing. I mean, it, it, it's, the First Amendment isn't really tied in with social media. If I go onto Facebook and I say something really stupid, like, for example, if I was to make a death threat against a politician, which I never would, I actually am entitled to like actually held that because that's a serious threat against somebody, especially an elected official. That's not going to protect me from anything. That's not going to protect me from anybody. And that's what you all need to understand. Words do have consequences at times. Now, I brought this question up to somebody earlier and I did not get this question answered. If a man has a wife who is obese and another guy come starts heckling her from across the street. Is he free from consequences? No, he is not. The husband has every right to go up and knock that dude and kick his teeth in, essentially. Now, is it right for the husband to defend his wife? Of course it is. Is it right that he physically assaults somebody? <laughs> well, I'm not going to shed any tears for that, but that's where the point kind of comes in. Just because you can say some things in public doesn't mean you always should, essentially. Now, I'm going to pretty much close out by saying this. People definitely need to be educated on what the Constitution is and at what it means in its entirety. So now Elon Musk now owns Twitter. Hashtag big friggin' deal. Who cares? Let's carry on.
This week, Dr. Mehmet Oz and former mayor of Braddock and current lieutenant governor John Fetterman had their debate. It wasn't the worst debate I've ever seen. That The worst debate still goes down between uh, Marcus Flowers and Congresswoman Marjorie Trader Greene. And that still is the worst, biggest dumpster fire I've ever seen. But this exactly was a kind of a hard debate to kind of listen to. Now, the, the topics they primarily focused on were immigration, inflation, education, energy independence, and abortion. Now, as everybody knows, John Fetterman suffered a stroke a few months back before the primaries, and his health was a major, major concern for the public. He has, however, ban- bounced back. Now, one thing I never knew about him is that he also suffers from auditory processing. Now, for those that are not aware, auditory processing is not hearing is not necessarily hearing loss or a learning disorder. It just means that your brain hears things differently in the usual way. It can be hard for people with auditory processes to follow conversations, know where a sound came from, or remember all instructions give, uh, uh, given, especially if they uh, how many steps are there to be taken. Now, for example, somebody like me, I suffer from auditory auditory processing. Now, if you give me a series of instructions, and if I don't remember all of them, that's because I'm still trying to process everything you're telling me. Now, I don't really have it as bad as John Fetterman does. Fetterman, however, needs captions at times to help him better understand what he's being asked to him, and if it and it actually does help him process information better. Sometimes I need to be completely zeroed in in order to really understand what somebody means, and sometimes it affects the way I talk to get my point across. So sometimes if it seems like I'm talking and saying repeat words over and over again, it's just how I talk. I mean, I, I'm still working on it. Forgive me, I'm human. Now, the audio I'm going to play is what I consider Fetterman's biggest Achilles heel. The topic was about fracking, so please listen in on this. We are going to move on to the next topic, and this has come up earlier, and that is the issue of fracking. Pennsylvania only trails Texas in terms of natural gas production. Both of you have taken shifting positions on the issue of fracking. Mr. Oz, we begin with you. You wrote a column in 2014 calling for no fracking pending health study results. But in a video posted on social media in March, you said, quote, natural gas guarantees high paying skilled jobs right here in Pennsylvania. So back off, Biden. Give us freedom to frack. Mr. Oz, please explain that changing position. 60 seconds. I've been very consistent. Fracking has been demonstrated. It's a very old technology to be safe. Uh, It is a lifeline for this commonwealth to be able to build wealth, similar to what they've been able to achieve in other states. For that reason, I strongly support fracking, drilling, the piping of that natural gas. In fact, I built a facility even in Philadelphia so we can export it uh, to our allies and help them, the ones that are struggling now in Eastern and Western Europe because of the Ukrainian war. John Fetterman calls fracking a stain on Pennsylvania. He says that he will sign a moratorium to ban its continued use. He's against pipelines. He voted or supported the vote against the Keystone pipeline that ended up shutting it down. He supports Biden's desire to ban fracking on public lands, which are our lands, all of our lands together. This is a extreme position on energy. If we unleashed our energy here in Pennsylvania, it would help everybody. Why John Fetterman is so rigidly stuck on fighting against uh, energy companies is is stunning to me because it's the jobs I want. Tens of thousands of high-paying jobs to help Pennsylvanians. Thank you, Mr. Oz. Uh, Oz rule. Mr. Fetterman, you know, I absolutely seconds. support fracking. In fact, I live across the street from a, the, a steel mill, and they were going to frack to create their own energy in order to make them more competitive, and I support that living closer to anybody else in Pennsylvania for fracking to myself. I believe that we need independence with energy, and I believe I've walked that line my entire career. I believe Democrats... Mr. Mr. Fetterman, I do have a specific question, which you can continue on this topic, but you have made two conflicting statements regarding fracking. In a 2018 interview, you said, quote, I don't support fracking at all. I never have. But earlier this month, you told an interviewer, quote, I support fracking. I support the energy independence that we should have here in the United States. So, Mr. Fetterman, please explain your changing position. 60 seconds. Uh, I've, I've always supported fracking. And I always believe that independence with our energy is, is critical. We can't be held, you know, you know, ransom to somebody like Russia. You know, I've always believed that energy independence is critical. And I've always believed that. And I do support fracking. I've never taken any money from their 
their, their industry, but I support how critical it is that we produce our own energy and create energy independence. I must correct the record. Uh, well, he uh, just a second, Mr. Oz. I do want to clarify something. You're saying tonight that you support fracking, that you've always supported fracking, but there is that 2018 interview that you said, quote, I don't support fracking at all. So how do you square the two? Uh, I, I, I do support fracking, and I don't, I don't, I support fracking, and I stand, and I do support fracking. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fetterman. On I'm to sorry, the Lisa. But there, there's not just a statement you read. There are multiple. There's pictures uh, of him signing we a have to go. We have to move on. But I, we have I, to I, get the fundamentals of the truth out we, here. John we Fetterman have a over and over topics. again took positions against energy. We have a lot of topics. You will have a chance to have that the, in your the, closing. One, one comment, then. The energy we, industry we is living in fear on. of we John Fetterman. On, I want to know on why. To the Mr. New Ross, topic. That was really hard to listen to when I listened to it because he said that he support has always supported fracking. But then they asked him, what about your statement in 2018 that says you did not support fracking? And he had no answer for it. Now, some might attribute that to his auditory processing. But the thing is, though, it's okay to say I used to not believe in fracking, but now I do believe in fracking because I see how important it actually is to the economy. Or you can actually make a reason as to why you've changed your position. There's nothing wrong with the change in position. You're not going to look bad. That looks really bad for John Fetterman. Now, don't get me wrong. I do like John Fetterman. I think he would make a great U.S. senator. I don't think Dr. Haas would make a good senator whatsoever. But it's just that was such a difficult part and such a critical part. He really could have capitalized on that. And I don't know. Maybe he just didn't really understand the question or maybe he didn't really understand what they were asking him. But it seemed like it. he was a little flustered at that point. He might have seemed a little uncomfortable at that point because they were making it seem like he's a hypocrite now because before he said, I don't support fracking. Now I do support fracking. It is a dangerous look, especially for those that utilize the, uh, uh, component uh, that utilizes the resources from fracking, like natural gas, essentially, for example. Now I do think that I still believe that John Fetterman would make a great U S Senator. Definitely. Now, some of the things that Dr. Oz also attacked him on was the fact that when he was mayor for Braddock, there was a gunshot that went off and John Fetterman pursued somebody that he saw wearing a ski mask and held this guy at gunpoint with a shotgun. Now, this person turned out to not be the culprit, but he was a black gentleman. And basically, people went after John Fetterman for doing this. Now, I want everybody to understand something. I actually looked into this, and the man that was actually held at gunpoint says, I have no ill will feelings towards Sen uh, to, um, John Fetterman. I do think that if the truth came out, it could really hurt his chances, but I think he would make a great U.S. senator. He actually indicates that he would make a great U.S. senator. I mean, talk about some really – I mean, how much of a guy do you have to be like – I could hold a guy at gunpoint and this guy could still vote for me kind of deal. I mean, that's some pretty awesome shit right there. But again, I feel like this part of the debate when they talked about fracking was the Achilles heel that really crippled him throughout the debate. Honestly, everything else I thought he did pretty well on because let's just get it down to brass taxes. Um, Dr. Oz is a polished turd. Essentially. He's a very, very polished turd because this guy has, made a career off of being on television. This guy has been on television television for decades. He's made millions off of his products. He's used to talking on television. He's used to looking good. That doesn't mean he's going to be a great U.S. senator. What are the, some of the things that are helping Dr. Oz is the fact that he's a celebrity and he has the backing of Donald Trump. I remember when the election was going, when the primaries were going on, it was really close between Dr. Oz and a guy by the name of McCormick. There were people that could not stand Oz. They think he's a fraud. They think he's a piece of shit. But now I see these same people that say, I can't stand Dr. Oz. Now they're at his campaign rallies, and they're all standing behind him, and they're all smiles. They're all like, yay, we like Dr. Oz. The only reason why you like Dr. Oz is because he's got the endorsement for Trump. It's that is. That, that's his entire platform. And that is scary that people are willing to vote for him. Because they either like him because he's been endorsed by Trump or it's because they just don't like John Fetterman because 
They use the fact that he never had a job, really, even though he was the mayor of Braddock. And they say the fact that, you know, he lived with his parents. I mean, who cares? I mean, I thought conservatives were all about family values, honestly. I mean, I, it seems like they want to have it both ways. They want a politician that can relate to the American people, but yet they are voting for Dr. Oz, who doesn't even freaking live in Pennsylvania. He's from New Jersey, for crying out loud. They want somebody that can relate to the American people, but this guy's a multimillionaire. I thought they were against the elites, the wealthy elites, for crying out loud. But because it's John Fetterman, they're completely against him. I, make it make sense for me anyway. So, I mean, again, Dr. Oz is a TV personality. He's used to making himself look good. John Fetterman suffers from auditory processing, is still recovering from a stroke, and has still managed to prove that his record shows that he is actually a very decent guy. I mean, I've watched a few TED Talks from him. He seems like a pretty stand-up person. He seems to have a good understanding of the citizens, society, where he comes from, and he's never forgotten his roots. So honestly, if I was living in PA, I would definitely vote for John Fetterman in a heartbeat. But unfortunately, we, I mean, not unfortunately, but we live in Michigan, so I can't vote for John Fetterman, essentially. So at the end of the day, it wasn't really a bad debate. I just feel like John Fetterman really could have just knuckled down and just bit the bullet and said, I used to believe that fracking was bad, but now I believe that fracking is good or maintain the position that he still believes fracking is bad because there are legitimate reasons as to why fracking is bad because it actually can affect the water supply for some people. And th But that's another issue I can cover for another time. But there actually are legitimate concerns in regards to fracking, especially when it comes down to drinking water. But anyway, got to move on to the next topic. I'm going to say right now, I am a huge fan of Secretary Pete Buttigieg. When he ran for president in 2019 and 2020, I fully supported him. I don't always agree with him on some of his topics, but my God, is he impressive. He speaks multiple languages fluently. I mean, he taught himself uh, Norwegian. It's, he's a Rhodes Scholar. He's a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, like me. A former mayor of South Bend, a proud father and husband to Chase and Buttigieg, a school teacher. And now he's the Secretary of Transportation. And let me tell you what, he is absolutely freaking killing it. He's out there just platforming. He's out there, you know, seeing the projects that need to be done. And he was just recently actually on Stephen Colbert's late night show to talk about the infrastructure bill and how so many Republicans vote against it. Yeah, you need to listen to this. Does it make you mad or do you get frustrated when, when, when people who voted against the bill, like Rick Scott and Representative Tony Gonzalez, don't refuse the money and then actually make a big deal about having gotten the money for their constituents. It is striking that people went to the floor of the House or Senate and said, no, this infrastructure funding should not happen. And then they can't wait to be there uh, when that funding is coming to their district. Mm -hmm. But do you, you make know. them hold the big check? <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about that. I might try that. It'd be uh, good. You and the check and them. But I also there's nothing better than seeing a skeptic become a convert. And so, uh, you know, I think I call it the sincerest form of flattery. If somebody was against your policy and then when it's actually benefiting people who live in their communities, yes. they can't hug you close enough. And I'll say this. I mean, politics aside, the people who live in those communities shouldn't be punished of because their senator or their House member said no to this funding. We're going to serve everybody equally. I suspect you would say something like that. I suspected you would have the... The, the best interest of the American people at heart. Well, thanks. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that's how we think about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it comes from the top. I mean, don't get me wrong. It, it can be frustrating politically yeah. uh, when, when you see that sort of stuff go on. But, you know, look, this is, this is part of a pattern that we've often seen where uh, many uh, congressional Republicans mm -hmm. take stances that seem to be more about the problem than about the solution. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you look at even the things that they talk about the most often, mm -hmm. uh, immigration, inflation. I mean, name of, of all the things congressional Republicans have proposed policy-wise, can anybody name the top five things that they've suggested to fight inflation? Can anyone name three? How about one? You know, they voted no on the Inflation Reduction Act that was about lowering prices for Americans. And I would have loved nothing more than to have a debate between the Democratic Re Inflation Reduction Act and the Republican Inflation Reduction Act on the House of the Floor and Senate and argued over which one was better, but there was only one, and it was ours. And luckily, it passed. How can you not love that guy? That guy is just, 
the thing is, what's amazing is I've seen him go on Fox News multiple times, and they have tried so hard to undermine him or just make him sound stupid, but he just, he's ready for it. I mean, this guy is insanely intelligent. He's articulate. I mean, this guy is going to be president someday. I'm saying it now, and I would vote for him. And I would even want to work on his freaking campaign, for crying out loud. That's how much I like Pete Buttigieg, and I don't really like politicians very much. I mean, yeah, I might agree with a lot of them. Like, there are very few politicians that I actually look at. like, you know what? I like this person. There are some politicians who are like, you know what? I agree with that, honestly. There are some politicians I'm somewhat warming up to, honestly. And I'm not saying I'm going to throw myself at their feet and say, yes, I worship you. But Pete Buttigieg, I like him because he really said it just because an elected official, a senator, or a Somebody in the GOP voted no against this. It doesn't mean that their citizens have to suffer. That's how things are supposed to be for crying out loud. He said it so well. He really just, mm, he just oozes this charisma and actually seems like he gives a shit about the people because let's get, let's just break it down. When I did a podcast a while back talking about how we are 13th in the world when it comes to infrastructure. We're supposedly still the richest nation on earth, but we are 13th in infrastructure. That is pathetic. I mean, we should be in the top five in regards to infrastructure if we're the richest nation in the world. But because we don't emphasize on infrastructure, that's the main reason why it just irritates me so much that Republicans keep talking a big game about infrastructure. There was a $500 billion infrastructure package during the last administration's era, but... Trump decided to back out of the deal and not sign off on it, even though it had bipartisan support, simply because of the Russia investigation. That's why he backed out. And yes, I'm still bringing this up because it's true. We have been so far behind the rest of the developed world when it comes down to infrastructure. We could have a high-speed rail system, but no, people don't want it. Why? Because they think a train system is completely outdated. Do people have any idea that train systems are still essential? I said in one of my podcasts that in one of my episodes talk about how train systems are essential because of how much freight comes across the country. If those rail systems break down, that just means that, you know, prices are going to continue to go up because of, you know, more truck drivers having to drive from one side of the country to the next. And it's going to take a little bit longer to get back. I mean, it's so essential to make sure that the rail systems keep running. Why can't we have more People trains, essentially. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy to think about how we don't have a high-speed rail system. When I've been on these high-speed rail systems in Germany, and I tell you what, they are a lot of fun. I mean, you can get from one side of the country to the next in like two and a half, three hours, and I enjoy it. I have a great time doing that. But I think what's so important that he really emphasized was when the Inflation Reduction Act first came out, there were a lot of Republicans that were completely against it. They thought this was not going to curtail inflation. This isn't going to help us. And he really nailed it. It's like, well, I would have loved to have seen the Republicans come up with a better solution, but they didn't. It's like, can anybody name five things that the Republicans have done to, you know, to, to, to combat something we said? C- can you think of one? You can't, can you? That's because there is no solution to the to problems they always address. Now, they have offered nothing in regards to health care, inflation, gas prices, gun safety, mental health, school safety, infrastructure, and border security. They All they do is they continue to address the problem. All they say is, oh, Biden wants open borders, which is not true. Nobody wants open borders. Now, I've never heard one politician advocate for open borders, but they just say open borders because it's a nice buzzword for people that are not informed on these topics. They do nothing about mental health. They think school safety just means more school resource officers when that does nothing. It doesn't prevent school shootings. It actually encourages them in a way. School resource officers have not proven to deter gun violence. They've done little to nothing in in regards to infrastructure, but they are happy to take the funding and make themselves look good for their constituents. They think any form of gun safety is just another form of gun control, and they think that that's just taken away from the rights of citizens. They have basically blocked price gouging at the pumps – because they don't believe in that. They have offered no solutions in regards to inflation. And when Obamacare initially got introduced by former President Obama, he the, the GOP was coming out and saying, no, 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 this is socialism. We can't have government-funded health care. 
You know what Obama said? Okay, bring me a solution. Give me an idea. What would you prefer? And they brought nothing. Zero. Zilch. They didn't bring anything to the freaking table. Now, are there some times where the GOP might bring something forward that's good? <laughs> Maybe. I can't remember the last time I saw something good for the GOP, honestly. But I can tell you this much. If they brought something good that could actually benefit the American people, I'd be willing to hear about it. And Secretary Buttigieg actually brought something forward and a very good point about this. If they brought forward something that could actually be an attainable solution that could actually make things better for our country, I'd be willing to hear it for crying out loud. Because that's what we should be doing in this country is coming up with the solutions to make the country better. I mean, this shouldn't – I should not have to be saying this. But it should be common freaking sense. But for some reason, people are like, oh, no, I don't want to vote for this. That's socialism. Do you even know what socialism means, you knuckleheads? Socialism is the idea and the theory to where – the workers slash the community control and own the means of production. That's what that means. It's not Social Security. It's not the military. It's none of those things. It's not the infrastructure bill. That's not socialism. You have no idea what socialism means. It's just a nice buzzword for you. It just goes to show you don't know what the hell you're talking about. It's, and I'm telling you, when Secretary Pete runs for president again, I would be – I would love to work on his campaign. That would just be the greatest thing ever, honestly. I would be glad to do so because I think he would make a great president someday. He's not a, a divider. He's a uniter. He wants everybody to benefit from the programs we put in place to make the country better. That's the way things are supposed to be. Coming together to find solutions to problems instead of just doing nothing but addressing the problem and doing absolutely jack diddly squat about it. So you're not going to believe this. There are people, armed vigilantes, being seen at ballot boxes, for example, in Arizona. So this is about three and a half minutes of audio, okay? I'm going to give full credit to the news organization that discloses. Outside an early ballot drop box in Mesa, Arizona, two men armed, wearing tactical gear, watching voters. A vigil taking place over multiple nights. Hi, guys. One woman, a Phoenix area grandmother, decided to confront them. Okay. Hey, don't touch oh. Oh. Why did you decide to go out there? I'm standing up and pushing back against those people and standing up for everybody's right to vote. You don't mind if I set up right here, do you? Without fear of uh, retaliation or any kind of intimidation. Hi, how are you? She asked we you? not show her face because she did this, went right up in the armed man's face. You know, I, I don't talk. I, I take care of business. I go out there and I do what I have to do. Nice to meet you. I push Hi. back against uh, these kind of people, right, people who are intimidating voters. No, he's putting that in my face. I'm sitting down. He's with a gun standing over top of me. And I'm standing up and pushing back against those people and standing up for everybody's right to vote without fear of uh, retaliation or any kind of intimidation. I'm just sitting here. I'm not even communicating with them. I'm sitting right here. You know, seeing that, you would think you were in, you know, some autocratic nation and not the United States of America. Two outdoor ballot drop boxes in Maricopa County have become an election flashpoint. Around the clock, so-called ballot watchers are camped out. Late Sunday night, we saw this group of women at the same drop box. You're not supposed to talk to anybody? Not going to. Thank you. They didn't want to talk. At another drop box in downtown Phoenix, they're photographing voters. And already, these actions are impacting how voters feel. According to complaints filed and referred to the Department of Justice last week, one voter complained he was called a mule. That's a reference to a conspiracy movie that spread lies about the 2020 election. I'm talking about people who have spread lies. To Maricopa County Board Supervisor Bill Look, Gates, a I'm Republican who has who defended has the election power. process, two years of lies have come to this. Why are you in camouflage? From, from what, how, how's that going to keep people from seeing you? You're in a parking lot. We're really losing rationality and logic here. 
Arizona has lived through the discredited partisan review of Maricopa County's 2020 ballots. And now Republicans on the midterm ballot, like gubernatorial nominee Kerry Lake, are raising doubts about this November's election before a single vote has even been counted. I'm afraid that it probably is not going to be completely fair. I wish I could sit here and say I have complete faith in this system. I don't have faith in this system. We begin to look at defining fence. Republican Secretary of State nominee Mark Fincham urged followers on social media to watch all drop boxes and made a conspiracy reference to Democratic donor George Soros. This is why we have elections, to avoid these, start, these sort of confrontations. It's been normalized in some way over the past few years, but we're not going to normalize it here in Maricopa County. I encourage people, let's take the temperature down. I mean, what in the hell were these people doing outside of these ballot boxes? Armed. Now, I'm not against people exercising their Second Amendment right, but I want everybody to remember, let's take a trip back down memory lane. In 2008, there were Black Panthers that were outside of a polling station in Pennsylvania, in I think it was Philadelphia, with nightsticks. Now, I remember Fox News losing their absolute freaking minds because this could be, you know, considered voter intimidation, which I would actually agree. Anytime you are seen outside of a polling place and you are armed to the teeth, even if it's with nightsticks or something like that and military apparel, I'm going to take that as somebody that is trying to blockade me from voting. And if I even think about going in to vote or something like that, I would not be wanting to vote. But the fact of the matter is you got people out here outside of ballot boxes that are accusing people of being mules because of a fraudulent by Dinesh to douchebag. Yes, Dinesh to Souza called 2000 mules talking about how the vote, the, the election was stolen because of some bullshit conspiracy theory, but yet these people are calling people exercising their rights as citizens to vote, calling them mules while being armed. Now, granted, I have not heard any reports of people actually threatening them with firearms or anything like that, but the, the appearance, optics is absolutely everything. And the fact that these knuckleheads are out there outside of ballot boxes... I mean, they have no reason to be out there. I mean, they could be out there if they want to, but they have no reason to be out there. We all know what they're up to. These people are basically committing intimidation. I mean, it, it's blatantly obvious. That's the way I would take it, at least. If I was to go outside a ballot box tomorrow and see somebody armed in full camouflage, I'm going to ask them, okay, what the hell do you think you're doing? And if they don't answer me, then it's blatantly obvious what they're going to do. That just means that they don't want to say what they're there for, but the intent is, in fact, there. I mean, seriously, people, it, it doesn't take rocket science to figure this out. This is voter intimidation. Now, voters, do not be intimidated by these thugs. They're not going to do anything to you, but I understand your concern. If you feel like you cannot go to a ballot box, take a friend with you. Take somebody with you. Don't go there alone, especially if you feel like these people could in, uh, encourage me not to drop my ballot. They could say that I'm trying to once again seal the election. Do not be intimidated. That's all they're there for is just to intimidate you into not voting. I highly encourage people to get out there and vote. Don't let these thugs intimidate you. Don't let these thugs try to drive you from exercising your right to vote for the person you want to vote for. Even if it's for a Republican, you should not be intimidated into voting. It's wrong that people are actually doing this. It's wrong that people are partaking in this. It's bad enough that we got people that still believe that 2020 election was stolen over some bullshit. The election was not stolen in 2020. If you believe it, you're a moron. It's plain and simple. And I would definitely tell that to anybody. The election was not stolen. Everybody, every elected official that sees this needs to denounce this right away. I don't think they will, though. I think there are certain elected officials or people that are running for election that are going to encourage this. They actually want to see this kind of intimidation because they want to believe in a fair election. I mean, Carrie Lake, she is running for governor for the state of Arizona. She's also endorsed by Trump. When she was asked, would you, uh, uh, what's it called? Would you concede the election or accept the results of the election? She says, I will accept the results of the election because I'm going to win this election. And then she was asked, would you concede the election if you don't win the election? She's like, I'm going to win this election. 
she's not willing to answer the question. Guess who also didn't answer the question like that? Donald Trump. It's bad when you have somebody that is running for office that does not concede the election. Even it's blatantly clear that they lost the damn election. So again, don't be intimidated by these thugs. Take a friend. Take a group of friends. Hell, call your entire friends and family to come out and support you as you go cast your ballot. Who cares? Do it because these people cannot intimidate you into doing what you believe in, especially when it comes down to voting in this next upcoming election. Because the midterms is very important because this election is going to determine who's going to be elected governor, who's going to take the House, and who's going to take the Senate. Don't let them win. Last night, Paul Pelosi was attacked by a 42-year-old by the name of David DePape, or DePape, or whatever, and he is being charged with attempted homicide, assault, and with a deadly weapon, elder abuse, burglary, among other felonies. Now, as of right now, Paul Pelosi is not in critical condition. He's in stable condition. He's expected to make a full recovery. Now, sources indicate that he broke in looking for the Speaker of the House. Uh, when when the attacker was not looking, Paul Pelosi got on the phone and he contacted the police and they came over to do a welfare check because he was actually able to disclose what was going on. When they saw him, he said that he was were waiting for Nancy Pelosi when the police came up to him. They were able to take the weapon away from him. He did assault Mr. Pelosi with a hammer and... After that, they took him to the hospital. They took both to the hospital, and now uh, David Tapapi is going to be charged. Essentially, of course, already the conspiracy theorists are suggesting this was a setup, and they're wondering how is it a guy was able to attack the Speaker Pelosi's husband? Where was the security? For the record, Nancy Pelosi was not home. She was in Washington D.C. Her husband was. Apparently, he is not guaranteed security. She is because she's third in line to the presidency. Now, I'm not going to suggest that certain people are behind this. This guy very well could be a nutcase. This guy could just be a lone wolf. It is entirely possible. However, when was the last time we heard about rhetoric like this where Nancy Pelosi was threatened to be attacked? Oh, yeah, that's right. January 6th of 2021. There were people that entered the Capitol looking for Nancy Pelosi, looking for Mike Pence looking for other elected officials like AOC. These people were looking to cause harm on January 6th. This guy did cause harm to Nancy Pelosi's husband. Now, don't get me wrong. I get it. People are upset that Paul Pelosi that uh, that was driving under the influence and he pretty much got a slap on the wrist. I get that. I'm upset about that too. But this is a situation where he was attacked by somebody that was looking for his wife. He was assaulted simply because he is the husband of the Speaker of the House of the United States of America. For crying out loud, people, when is this bullshit going to end? I mean, what is wrong with you? I don't encourage violence on any elected official. I mean, there might be some elected officials I don't freaking like. There's plenty of them out there, but I don't wish harm upon them. I don't wish harm upon any Supreme Court justice if I don't like them. Because I put it to you like this. If you can justify violence towards one elected official, you can justify doing it to anybody, especially if you don't like them enough. I mean, look what happened just recently. Three of the people that were involved in the plot to want to kidnap our governor, Gretchen Whitmer, have now been found guilty on all charges. Good. They definitely deserve to be thrown in prison for what they did because it's bullshit that they were actually willing to cause harm to our governor in the state of Michigan. I don't condone violence whatsoever. Fortunately, there are some elected officials that say we do not con- we condemn this violence in every form. Even Ted Cruz said that we condemn this violence. We hope that he has a swift recovery. Even Marjorie Trader Green says I condemn this violence. It should not be happening. I was really surprised by that because there's a video out there calling Nancy Pelosi a traitor, and we, we do and the death penalty and we impose the death penalty for traitors for crying out loud. It's on Twitter. It's a, it's a deleted video, but you can find it on Twitter. I mean, I wish I had the audio with me right now, but she's actually convinced that Nancy Pelosi has committed treason, and we throw traitors out of our country and. The penalty for treason is death. But I cannot stress this enough, people. It is wrong to conduct violence 
against elected officials or just people in general. I mean, you shouldn't do something like that. I know I said something earlier about if a guy's heckling another person's wife, you know, that could be, you know, hazy air. But we're talking about a guy that just came home or was home and a guy broke into his house and assaulted him just because his wife happens to be the Speaker of the House. This is craziness. It's absolute craziness. I don't care if you're left, right, middle, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, moderate, what have you. If you commit violence against an elected official, you're a horrible human being. I don't care what you are. We are not living in tyrannical times where it's warranted for you to rise up against your so-called oppressors, okay? It's not okay. These are elected officials. They are elected into these positions of power, and until they are voted out of office, you should not attack them. Well, I mean, you shouldn't attack them, period, essentially. You should definitely not go after their families. I mean, this is this should be blatantly obvious. Now, this is just one more case. This is not the end. It definitely isn't. And I really hope that people really start to crack down upon this. And if you hear something or if you see something, say something about it. Because I wonder what this guy's social media profile looks like. Where does his political affiliations lie? Did anybody radicalize him? I mean, if this was like a Muslim terrorist, you could bet your bottom dollar that the conservative base would be like, this is why we can't have Islam in our country. But in a case like this, they're probably just going to say, oh, he was just a nut job, and we denounce this violence. There's a reason why dangerous rhetoric like this needs to be, I wouldn't say controlled, or it just needs to be denounced at the highest order. It needs to be completely just put out of its misery. We cannot have dangerous rhetoric like this running around rampant in our streets and condoned. Again, we do not live in tyrannical times. Depending on what the House and the Senate and who runs and wins in 2024 could make a different determination, but I'm not going to speculate on that just now. Now, I, again, I cannot stress this enough. I'm not a big fan of Nancy Pelosi. I don't think she's a bad person. I'm just... There's there's many reasons as to why I just don't really care for her too much. I don't think she's a bad person, though. Her husband definitely did not deserve to be attacked. She doesn't deserve to be attacked. You know, even if I disagree with some of her policies, she does not deserve this, and neither did her husband. It's that simple. I mean, I shouldn't even have to say that, but yet, obviously, somebody has to come out and say it, essentially. Hopefully, more people come out and denounce this. And hopefully the rest of the MAGA crowd will just denounce this guy and say, no, this never should have happened. But I seriously doubt the rest of the MAGA crowd would follow down this route. So anyway, I'm going to close out tonight by saying thank you to everybody that took the time to listen in on the live show. And thank you to those that are listening on the repeat. If you haven't done so, go ahead and hit like and share and be sure to just show me some love on this podcast. But my final thoughts on this are the midterms are closing in. November 8th is just a couple weeks away. It's really, really important for you that however you vote, whether you vote absentee, military, mail-in, or vote in person, it's so essential that you find out who your candidates are, what their positions are, and vote your heart and your conscience. There are many people out there that say they're not voting. Now, it's entirely your right to not vote, but I, my only question to you is this. If you, why don't you vote? Get out there and vote your heart and your conscience because whether you realize it or not, who you vote for in the next election is so essential, especially for governor, senate, congressman, representative. These people are going to represent you and your wishes. Now, are they going to be perfect? Of course not. They're human beings. Nobody's perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect person, especially an elected official. They're going to make you mad. They're going to make you upset. You're going to disagree with them on a lot of topics, but you know what? They are still people. They are capable of making mistakes but it's so important for you to get out there even if you vote none of the above it goes to show that you're participating and you're taking part in the election but it's so important for you to get there and vote there are plenty of volunteers out there my wife included that are out there canvassing for elected officials and it's so important for you to just you know take a couple minutes to hear them out now i'm not going to force you and tell you no you have to listen to what they have to say it's until your decision to not hear these people up. But what do you have to lose? You might think, oh, the whole entire establishment is screwed up. It's terrible. I don't want to listen to a word they have to say. I get it. I understand. I understand where you come from. Believe me, I was a registered independent for decades. But it's just, what do you have to lose 
by hearing a few people out. You might hear something that just might click. You know what? I might hear this out. I might actually vote for this person. Or it's like, you know what? I'm not going to vote for this candidate anymore. I'm going to vote for somebody else now. I mean, it's entirely up to you. You gain, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by going out there and voting. I highly encourage people to get out there and vote. Voting is an essential part of what keeps this republic going. I can't stress it any further. Get out there and vote. Find out who your candidates are. Vote, please, for the love of God, vote. Anyway, thanks so much for everybody for listening in. Thanks for everybody listening on the repeat tonight. Hopefully everybody has a great weekend. Stay vigilant, stay motivated, stay hydrated. Have a great night. This has been a podcast brought to you by the Alex Kirsch Project. Thank you for listening.